Well, what do you think? Did you come up with something sensible, some sensible reason why this weird thing is happening? All right, here, let's see. This that we just graphed here was inverse sine is on the outside? Yeah, so inverse sine of the sine of x. Okay. So let's kind of dissect this just a little bit. The first part of this that is supposed to be computed is the sine x. That's where the original input is going to live, which means, here, let me highlight this like so and say that its domain is what? Its domain for sine is all real numbers, which means that for the composition of this thing, its domain is also all real numbers, which is why we have a graph from negative infinity to positive infinity. We got all the way across this graph grid. Okay, all right then. And then uh, it outputs a number always from negative one to positive one, right? That's the output, the, the possible range for sine. This now becomes the domain for inverse sine. And what is inverse sine always output? It always outputs a number from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. And the reason for that, of course, is the fact that sine was not a one-to-one -one function, so we had to limit its domain so that the inverse sine would be a function, okay? Okay, so now, when we talked about the definition of inverses, they're supposed to cancel each other out. When I do this composition, this is F inverse composed with F, you're supposed to get X back, the original input which is like this graph here, it's y equals x, right? But that's not what I'm getting, right? When I looked at the one for e to the x and the natural log of x, that one was just like a ray, and it was just, let's say, this part of the graph, right? So this one is a lot more complicated than that. Before we, like, tackle this, let's, let's do uh, a calculator activity. This is just like a regular scientific calculator activity like this with degrees just because it'll be easier for us to see. Let's say that I do in the calculator this. The inverse sine of the sine of 30 degrees. I should get these things canceling each other out, and I should get 30 back, right? All right, and then if I do the inverse sine of the sine of 120 degrees, I should also get 120 degrees back, right? These are inverses, they cancel each other out. I don't know, let's see. Let's pull up this Desmos calculator and do the same exact thing. Uh, let's see, how do I pull up the, oh yeah, it's under functions here. The inverse sine, and inside there we wanna put the sine of we have it set to degrees, and then come back over here and just put in 30. Eh, 30, there we go, we got 30 back. All right, let's back that thing up now and then put 120 degrees in there. 120, there we go. Oh, look at that, we got 60 degrees back. Hmm, why is that happening? Remember, it's the exact same thing that's happening on this graph that's right here. I don't get 120, I get 60. And the reason why, again, is because 120 does not live in this little, uh, this interval here, but 60 degrees does, and it has the same sine value, right? If you put this thing on the unit circle, whenever we draw in the little uh, right triangle, for 120 degrees, which is the same thing as 2 pi over 3, I get this square root of 3 over 2. Yeah, but the inverse sine is not going to return that value, and the reason why it's not is because it doesn't live over here on this half of the unit circle. But there is a sine value. There is an angle that has the exact same sine value, which is the one over here for pi over, whoops, not pi over six, pi over three, which same thing, of course, is 60 degrees, okay? So whenever I go to, say, plot some points for this weird O graph, let's say that I take the inverse sine, we're gonna go back to radians now instead of degrees, the inverse sine of the sine of zero. Zero radians, not zero degrees, okay? Get it straight. So the first part of this is that we're supposed to take the sine of zero. Sine of zero is zero. So I have the inverse sine now of zero. Inverse sine of zero is zero. Hey, it worked out, everything is fine. 
and I get the ordered pair 0, 0, and it's this point on the graph. As a matter of fact, anything that I choose to do inside here, if I input any angle measurement in between negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, everything is going to work fine, and it's going to be on the line y equals x. Right? So I'll do one more that's on that interval. Inverse sine of the sine of pi over 2. What's the sine of pi over 2? It's uno. And the inverse sine of 1? It's this pi over 2 that's right there. So again, I get the ordered pair, pi over 2. That's the original input, and it output pi over 2. Okay, so it's this point on the graph. Voila. But what about this one here? Let's, let's take a look at this one. This is the number 3 pi over 2. Let's input that number. Inverse sine of the sine of 3 pi over 2. Okay, so I'm supposed to do the inverse, or no, no, I'm supposed to do the sine of 3 pi over 2 first. What's the sine of 3 pi over 2? It's this number right down here, which is negative 1. Inverse sine of negative 1. So I need to work that thing backwards. I do not get this 3 pi over 2 back, just like I didn't get the 120 back, because I only get to have a number in between here. So is there a number inside this interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 that has the same exact sine value as negative 1? And I do right here. It's at negative pi over 2. So think of it as this. Whoops, negative pi over 2. Now, when I build this ordered pair, I get 3 pi over 2, comma, negative pi over 2, which is this point right down there, right? And it continues to happen for the rest of the domain of that interior function, right? Which brings us back to those inverse properties and the interval over which each one of them works. So whenever I am composing sine with the arc sine, I get x backs, but x back, but only over the interval from negative 1 to positive 1. This is whenever I did the little graph. When I did the little graph, I just got the little segment. I just got, whoa, whoa, hey, where are you going? Do I have a picture of that graph? It was this little segment that we got, right? Okay. Uh, but if I do that in the reverse order, the arc sine composed with the sine, these things are going to cancel each other out and give you the original input, but specifically only over the interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And this is the one that gives us that weird function that looks like mirror, 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 right? All right, so I have the intervals. The uh, one for arc uh, cosine works exactly the same way. But you have a different interval for the inverse part of this. This one goes from 0 to pi instead of from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Same thing happens with tangent. Tangent has almost the exact same interval that it works on, except for you don't get pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 because you have asymptotes there. Okay? And then just in case you want them, if they ever, ever come up, here are the ones for cosecant, secant, and cotangent, and for their inverses. All right, in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to do some compositions again, but this time we're going to mix them up. Instead of having the uh, function, the trig function, with its inverse, we're just going to mix them up completely. You will see how that affects things.